Hey, everybody, welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Jeremy coming at you, episode 391. And we're doing something a little bit different today, something special. I have back on the show, fellow podcaster, friend, uh, wonderful martial artist, and, and amazing contributor to the martial arts community, Sensei Ando. Welcome, welcome back, Sensei. Mr. Jeremy Lesniak, it is an honor to be here, sir. Thank you very much for having me. Hey, it's it's an honor to have you. And we may have some listeners out there scratching their heads saying, wait a second, this is a this is a different kind of intro. It's a Thursday. We're getting another person's voice. What is going on? Because I'm completely blowing away anything that we do with any kind of format. And I think we have to explain what's going on. So here's what's going on. A couple weeks ago, I was in the car driving to a martial arts event. Big surprise there, right? And <laughs> what I think a lot of people know, maybe they don't, is that a lot of what I do in the car is listening to podcasts. And some of the podcasts I listen to are, no surprise, martial arts podcasts. And yours <laughs> is, of course, in that list because your show is one of my favorites. You do very kind of you. Thank you. And on this particular day, you had episode 70, which you titled Catching Another Thief. And it struck me a lot of times in, in Maybe you have this happen to you, listeners. I bet you have this happen to you where you're listening to something and it's just kind of there. It's just kind of background noise, whether it's music or a podcast. But this episode really was, was like a kick in the head. And why don't you tell the listeners about you know, what, what this episode was? Well, sure. Um, it was basically just, a, hey, a tale from the real streets. Oh my gosh, something actually happened. <laughs> um, a lot of us who are not bouncers or police officers um, you know, we get caught up in the theory world a lot, or I think I would do this, or uh, and we just had a chance to do a little something. Fortunately, it wasn't uh, overly violent. Uh, there was no weapon or a multiple attacker type situation, but it was something unexpected uh, in our real life. And my wife and I, um, that's what I'm referring to, my wife and I had to uh, step up and uh, take a little action to help apprehend a bad guy. And um, in the course of doing that, um, I, I learned a couple of things about myself, some things about my wife, and some things about the public at large. Yeah. Some good, some not so good. <laughs> so here's what we're going to do. We're going to run the episode, your episode, now. And then listeners, if you stick around after that, uh, since Ando and I will be here, and we're going to have some conversation, kind of a, a bit of a debrief. I wanted to share my thoughts, and, and we'll have a bit of a conversation about it. I love it. Hey there. Welcome to episode number 70 a fight for a happy life, the show that believes even a little martial arts makes life a whole lot better. Ando here, and once again, I'm recording today's episode as an audio podcast and on video. I hope one of these two formats is easy for you. Uh, either way, it's going to be a great show. I've got a story to tell you today about bringing a real-life bad guy to justice. My wife and I actually helped bring down a scumbag. I want to tell you that story and tell you what I learned. I got a lot to say about this, so let me grab a quick shot of coffee here, and we'll get right to it. First off, the title of this episode is Catching Another Thief. That's because you might recall the story I told in episode number 50 uh, about coming home and catching two punks breaking into my wife's car and my car uh, behind our building. In that story, I ended up chasing them down. I squared up with one of them. Um, we kept barking at each other until eventually we heard police sirens Then the guy bolted. Um, I eventually had to ID him. The cops caught him and they took him away as a little update on that story. I still, even though this was almost two years ago, um, I still have not received my flashlight back or the multi-tool that were taken out of my glove compartment. <laughs> so in effect, I still have been robbed, just not by the punks, by the cops. All right, so what happened this time? This time, uh, I went to the movies with my wife. And if I should back up, I should back up here one step to let you know that I had thrown out my back. So I was limping. And my wife had just come back from a snowboarding trip the day before, and she had tweaked her ankle, so she was also limping. It was quite a, kind of a pathetic scene. So my wife and I are coming out of the movie theater. It's about 9.30 at night, and we're holding hands like a cute old couple. <laughs> anyway, we're limping along and it was a cold night. So my wife didn't want to walk outside on street level to get back to our car. She said, hey, why don't we just stay to the underground level? So we're walking in the underground level of a parking garage. Um, and that's when we heard it. Someone started yelling, 
stop that guy. He broke into my car. Stop that guy. Sure enough, we looked over at the next lane. There were cars in between us. Uh, and this guy's booking like he's returning a kickoff at the Super Bowl. Ba, 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 ba. He's got a backpack and he's hustling. So in this moment, slow down here for a second. Having already been through this situation once uh, before, I'm thinking, okay, do I really want to chase this guy? This is a property crime, not a personal crime. In the other episode, it was my car, so there was a little ego involved. You know, I was a little personally offended. Uh, and there was also the issue of self-esteem. I was worried that my, my wife might think I was a wimp if I didn't go chase those punks. But in this case, it's not our stuff. It's just stuff. So as I'm kind of watching this guy run by, I'm thinking, I'm not sure if I'm going to... Too late. My wife takes off. <laughs> so it didn't matter what I thought. My wife started taking off after the guy. And obviously now I'm in. <laughs> 100% I'm in. Uh, <laughs> all right. So she takes off. And as a funny side note here, it turned out that her intention was not to catch the guy. I, of course, thought that's what she was thinking. Her intention was just to kind of keep bringing attention to what was going on, to keep screaming, hey, 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 and just kind of, you know, wave her arms and get attention. But I thought she was going to make a, a run for the guy. So anyway, we both take off and I start hustling. And because we're in this underground lot, there's really only one or two ways in or out of this place. And the way out was going to be right in front of me. This guy was going to have to cross in front of me to get to the exit. So I'm tracking him. I'm ahead of my wife now. What the heck? I'm fast. <laughs> so I get up to the front and he stumbles. And by the way, that happened in the other story too. Uh, if you're a thief, you might want to practice your sprinting with stuff because apparently it's hard to coordinate when you're under stress. So anyway, the guy, he's coming around the bend and I'm lined up right with him. It's going to be a perfect tackle. And the guy stumbles. So he skids out on his knee for a second and then he starts scrambling to get up. So I catch him about halfway up and I just slam into him with my elbows. Boom. I just blast into him. Uh, the guy scrambles a little bit more and I'm hovering over him. And as he's getting up, um, I just slapped on a seatbelt. Okay. So kind of a BJJ deal. Uh, one arm from behind over his shoulder and an underhook on the far arm on the other side. And, um, I just start riding him a little bit and I'm trying to keep it cool, right? Uh, you have an opportunity here. You could turn it into a choke. You can start punching him in the face. Uh, but I'm not, I'm just going to ride him for a second. I'm like, Hey, Hey, get down, get down. That's basically what I'm saying. So as I'm riding him and putting some weight on him and I'm starting to buckle him down, um, I break him down to his knees and, uh, then my wife jumps on the far side. So I've got the seatbelt and I grab his far hand. We break him down, uh, and ultimately we get him down on his belly. So now I've got the seatbelt. I'm sprawled out on one side. My wife kind of just put everything onto his far arm. So we have like a triple control on that far arm. Um, I made it a point. There's a, a lesson from the last, less, uh, last episode as well to always follow the hands, watch the hands. I don't know if this guy's got a knife or a gun. So uh, I not only have the seatbelt, but I also have a hand control on that far hand. And I've doubled up on my own hand, locked it in. So he's not doing anything with that hand. My wife had an underhook on that same arm. So I felt safe enough to let go with my left hand and bring that over to my side of his body where I could grab his other wrist, pin that to the ground. Um, so he's really not going anywhere. Um, technically, since you're probably a martial artist and you're interested in this kind of thing, uh, he was getting a little squirrely and kept trying to get up. So I did also step my knee over his close leg so that I could kind of pinch his leg and control, uh, what he was doing with his feet. Um, we had both arms controlled my weight on one side, my wife on the other. So he was really very well pinned. Now, second lesson that I remembered from the first time, uh, in the other episode, <laughs> when I chased that punk down, I was completely tunnel visioned on him. I totally forgot that he had had a partner with him. I lost track of where that guy had gone. And I was so locked into that guy that uh, I, I believe I joked that a parade could go by and I, I wouldn't have noticed. And that's true. Uh, but this time was totally the opposite. Because I had this guy very well controlled, I immediately started scanning the area, kept my head up, looking around, I don't know, maybe as a partner, um, so 
So I was very aware of what was going on around me uh, while we were on the ground. Um, in terms of damage, oh, what did I lose here? I, I thought I had those broken glasses here. I lost a pair of reading glasses. Those got smashed. Uh, and I ended up getting a bloody knee that soaked through my jeans because we were, you know, grinding on the ground a little bit there. Um, I shouldn't say we were grinding. I was trying to pin him down. <laughs> and uh, it ended up kind of uh, scuffing up my knee. Anyway, we're holding him down. And to me, this is the interesting part of the story. It's like a twilight zone because this is a public space. All right. This is going to be the big point of this podcast. (laughs) This is a public space. We are in a public parking lot. We end up holding this guy, my wife and I, for at least 10 minutes. It was probably more like 11 or 12, but we end up holding this guy down for a long time and we're not alone. I would say there were at least 30, maybe as many as 40 people who were around us while all of this was happening. Now, here's the weird part. Nobody else helped us. Not even the guy who owned the car. Not even that guy. That guy had his daughter with him. All right. We had just seen Captain Marvel, if you're interested. And he had this maybe 13-year-old blonde-haired girl, looked like Captain Marvel, and she's standing there with her dad and his friend, another male friend, two dudes, uh, and they're standing there, not too close, by the way, about 12 feet back, and my wife looks up and says, help us hold him, help us. The guy who owns the car has his phone out, he says, oh, I'm calling the police, I'm calling the police. That's what he's doing. His daughter's just standing there, and his friend's just watching. His friend with, I believe, purple suede shoes. I was on the ground, so I had a good good shot of that. All right, so the actual victims, if you will, of this property crime are not helping us in any way. And my wife's a woman, by the way. I don't mean to be sexist or anything, but to me, if there is a struggle going on, a physical struggle, and a woman looks up and says, help me, doesn't any human being, even if, especially if you're a dude, say, yeah, I'll help you, especially if it's my car or my friend's car. So this is the first level of what the hell is going on. But it goes beyond that. In this group of 30 to 40 people, all of whom are not close to us, by the way, they all have decided to stay back like 20, 30 feet behind me, to the side of me and across from me, all around. In that group, there are at least three uniformed, badged security officers. Not one of them, not one of them helped us. The other fellow who seemed to be an employee, he was like a valet. He was on the other side. I saw him as well. Also not helpful. Not only were they not helpful, at one point, uh, one of the security guards, it was a female, came over into my headspace. She leaned in, still about six feet away, <laughs> She leans in and she says, you can't touch him. You have to let him go. I looked up at her and just like this, I said, okay, when I let him go and he gets up to run, what are you going to do? She just looked at me. She just faded back. Didn't talk to her again. So not only were these people not helpful, um, they were trying to dissuade us from doing what I still believe to be the right thing. Again, I understand it's a property crime, but um, it's still ultimately a citizen's arrest of a bad guy. So at the end of the day, it was a good thing. But no help from the security guards. No help from the victims. And now let's talk about the public. Okay. (laughs) No help from the public. And again... You have a woman, my wife, 49-year-old woman, lying on the ground in nice clothes or out for the night, looking up to a bunch of dudes and some women saying, help me, help me hold him for over 10 minutes. And no. Now, there was one guy who after about three or four minutes, he was coming out of the gym, um, Jaron, I believe his name was, shout out to Jaron. He did come over. So not everybody is a schmutz or a putz or whatever word you want to make up. 
this guy did come over and he got knelt down behind me and helped just hold down uh, one of the guy's legs and at least just was a witness to all of this. This is why I'm so frustrated. Now, (laughs) I don't want to get too crazy about this, but this is why I'm really frustrated. I totally understand that most people don't want to get involved in anything. I get that. I've been that guy myself, particularly in my early life. If it's a physical situation, that makes it even harder. You see people scrambling on the ground or fighting, or it's even a domestic uh, uh, situation where the people really seem to know each other. It's like a family fight. And you just think, hey, this is not on me. That's on you. I get that. I also get that even if you don't think the situation is relevant to you or is even that dangerous, I understand that when there is physicality and fighting and violence, that most people are not prepared for that in any way. And that has its own um, uh, weight on their mind. Like, oh no, what's going to happen? I could get hurt. So not only don't they want to stand up and do something, even if it was just speaking up, If it's physical, there really is a reluctance to get involved because it's just an unknown. So I understand that. But in this case, again, the guy, the hard part was done. The the work was over. We had already taken him down. He was already pinned. As an interesting side note, because there was so much time, you might be wondering, well, what was the bad guy doing? Uh, He didn't just give up. Physically, he was contained. But mentally, he started going through a whole cycle of, uh, of nonsense, much like the guy in the other story. At first, um, when I chased down the other punk in, in episode 50, that guy started off like to huff and puff and looked like he was menacing and wanted to hit me. And then when he saw that strategy wasn't working, then he went really soft. He's like, oh, we're cool, man. We're cool. And I said, no, we're not cool. In this case, the guy, st- over 10 minutes, I'll, I'll make it quick. The guy started off just by saying, I got a five-year-old. Let me go, man. Let me go. I got a five-year-old. My wife (laughs) was really good at trash talk too. She said, hey, we got a five-year-old and we're not breaking into cars. We don't have a five-year-old, but it was pretty good trash talk. So after he tried to play the sympathy game and that didn't work, then he started getting, uh, pretending he was the victim. He started saying, somebody call the cops. They're f***ing me up. They're f***ing me up. And I just kept announcing, because again, I was watching, I was looking at everybody. I was being very aware of my surroundings. I just kept saying, you're fine, sir. He said, oh, you're choking me. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I said, if you can talk, you can breathe. No one's being hurt here. I just kept looking around and announcing what was going on. You're the bad guy. We're the good guys. You're not being hurt. We're waiting for the police. By the way, when the police show up, and eventually they do, two SUVs pull in, uh, I can't remember, three or four cops jump out, even they weren't in a hurry to help. They got out, the guy was adjusting his belt, they're taking their time, they start talking to someone on the periphery, before they come over to us, two citizens laying on top of another guy, they've been called in for an obvious uh, burglary or some type of crime, And they're in no hurry to come over to where the actual guy is. This was also blowing my mind. Anyway. (laughs) So my wife and I are pinned on this guy. This guy keeps screaming all kinds of nonsense about how he's the victim and he's the one getting hurt. And uh, we have our friend Jaron helping us uh, bear witness to all of this. Um, But I still can't get over how most people not only didn't want to get involved, they didn't even want to come close to at least show support. Again, the bar was so low for for you to be a hero in this story. Meaning, you come down the escalator, you're in the parking garage, you see there's something going on, you see that the guy's already pinned, you know the police have been called, and now you see this woman on the ground saying, someone help me hold him. All you have to do is come over and put your foot on the guy and you could take a selfie and go, look, I stopped a bad guy today. It would have been that easy. Anybody could have come over, just put a hand on the guy. You could have just come over and knelt by us and taken a picture if you wanted to and say, hey, I helped bring down a bad guy today. But no, this 30 to 40 people, some uniformed security officers and victims of a crime and friend 
all stayed as far back as possible just to watch, not to even talk. I don't even think anyone got it on a uh, phone. I hope they did. I was, I was looking for the video. Like, I want to see this because I can't believe that nobody helped. Let me get to the bigger point. The bigger point is this. I still believe that most people are good. I truly believe that most people, <laughs> if you ask them, hey, in a situation like this, would you help? They would say, absolutely. Of course I'd help. What are you talking about? But, I'm also doubling down on my belief that most people just are completely unprepared to take action when they need to. And this goes to the self-defense training. If you take a little bit of self-defense training, even a little martial arts, I believe that it's easier for you to speak up when you need to, stand up when you need to, and put your fists up if you need to. It's just that unfamiliarity that keeps people from doing what their heart wants them to do. This conflict between the heart and the head is just so sad to me. Because again, I'm not saying that all the people that were down there were bad people. That's really not my point. My point is that nice people don't know what to do or they're afraid to do something because our culture has been built up to not make noise to not take action, to not make a fuss, to not get involved. What can we do about this? This to me is the greatest problem there is because bad guys don't have this problem. Bad guys have decided, I will take action. I will do what I want. I will make noise and make a disturbance and make people uncomfortable and get what I want one way or the other. So how do we get team good guys to be able to stand up to the bad guys? Because it doesn't have to be everybody, mind you. We just need a few more to tip the scales a bit. Imagine that whole scene from the bad guy's point of view. He's in a public space. He had a leather glove on. He was smashing out windows, grabbing stuff, and putting it into his backpack and moving on. In his mind, he must have thought, I'm not afraid to do this, even if there are people around. Because I already know that most people, what are they going to do? They're not going to do anything. They're not going to chase me. They're not going to tackle me. They're not going to hold me. They're not going to get involved. So he feels completely free. Bad guys, I mean. They feel completely free to do whatever they want because experience has shown them that most people won't do anything. Therefore, they win. In this case, out of this 30 or 40 people, it happened that my wife signaled like, hey, I'm going to do something, which caused me to say, okay, well, then I'll do something. And that little bit of momentum tipped the scales just enough to grab this guy and put him down. And then that little action tipped the scales just enough to get Jaron to come over and he helped us out. Not bad. It was enough in that case, but terrible percentages here, right? If you have 40 people and they all believe that they're good people and I believe in their heart, they are good people, but only three actually follow through on those good intentions. You can see the problem here, right? Wouldn't it be amazing? What if the story I told you was completely the opposite? What if the story was, hey, we were walking through this parking lot and suddenly we heard, hey, stop that guy. And as we turned around, there were already four people running towards us. And these people all got together, 30 or 40 people. And they made a human wall in front of the exit. <laughs> and we all surrounded the bad guy and corralled him. And he never even got touched or hurt, but he knew it was over. So he put down the backpack and just put his hands up and said, okay, okay, you got me. And then the cops came and took him away. Wouldn't that be a great story? What if every bad guy had that fear in his heart? Not just about maybe I'll get caught on camera. Maybe somebody in the crowd will have a gun. Maybe there'll be some cop nearby. What if every bad guy knew, man, if I do anything, I know this whole crowd's going to turn against me and it's always going to be me versus team good guys. Can you imagine a world like that? where bad guys were that afraid to do something because they knew that all the good guys would absolutely stand up to them and take action? That'd be pretty impressive, huh? What can we do here? How do we solve this problem? It's easy to whine, but how do you solve this problem? 
I think it's not so hard. Number one, I've already said, is preparation. If everybody was training in some type of martial art, right, using their body, practicing standing up, practicing uh, the feeling of violence, using their body violently, explosively, managing someone else's body that's being violent, receiving an impact. I'm not talking about getting hurt. I just mean going back to like when you were a kid and a little rough housing or rolling around with your brother, your sister, your friends was not such a big deal. Sometime you grow up, uh, when you grow up, you kind of lose that comfortability. You lose that sense of touch. Everything becomes like, hey, back up or, you know, don't touch me. And everything becomes paranoid. Everyone's got their guard up. We all want our space. And then if you need to take physical action, that just adds another dimension of weird to the whole situation, which just slows you down as the good guy. And it keeps you from doing what your heart wants you to do and what society needs you to do. So one is preparation. And to help solve that, uh, coincidentally, I just finished my free, totally free, I don't want anything from you, uh, self-defense course. It's 10 videos, uh, 11 if you count the introduction, uh, two hours of just basic self-defense instruction. And if you're listening to this or watching this right now, I beg you, get the link, share it with your family, your friends, anyone you consider to be a good guy. It's family-friendly. I tried to make it entertaining and universal. I tried to uh, make sure you could practice some of these exercises at home. You don't need a partner or fancy equipment. But I do believe that's one big step. If all the good guys could just take this, even just that course, of course, I hope they'll go to a school uh, and train a little more seriously, get a partner, join a club, work this stuff out regularly. That'd be even better. But if all they have is a link to that self-defense course and that helps in some way, I will die a happy man, I promise you. So number one, prepare. And if that self-defense course is something you feel comfortable sharing, thank you for doing that. Number two, I would say another way we can help team good guys is to be a good role model yourself. Presumably you take some type of martial art and that's how you found this podcast or found this video, which means you're probably a little ahead of the game uh, when it comes to your family or your friends in being prepared to do something. I believe any training is better than no training. So be a good role model. Let people see you standing up for what's right. Let people see you take action when necessary. Let them see how you don't let bad guys have their way around you. In most cases, it's probably verbal. It's setting boundaries. It's letting people know what's not okay with you. Every time you do that, you're empowering other people to do the exact same thing. You have to believe that. How do you feel when you see someone stand up for themselves or fight back? You know, you get that feeling in your heart like, yeah, good, good for you. Go get them. And that makes you feel a little braver about doing the exact same thing. We all learn from each other. This is such an important point. We're all teachers and we're all students. When you're in a group of people, you have 30 or 40 people standing around, if you see the scales tipping, the mob mentality can work in your favor. Hey, we're all going to do something. We're all going to help. And that momentum pulls good things out of good people. If it tips the other way and no one's doing anything or only one or two people are doing something, and it's not clear now, wait, who's the good guy here? Who's the bad guy here? Then good people are just frozen. And the bad guys are moving that ball down the field. They're still getting what they want. So if you are someone who is preparing, you are in martial arts, you are getting bolder and stronger and clearer about your purpose in life. Well, let your friends see that. Let your family see that. Be the hero in your circles so that you can inspire everyone else around you to be a hero. I'm not calling myself a hero, by the way. I'm speaking in general. <laughs> Third thing, just off the top of my head, the other way you can maybe help is at the very least, share those videos that you find, share those uh, little memes and posters where you see someone in public doing the right thing. That might seem to talk about lowering the bar, but that's a really simple way to publicly show you're on Facebook, you're on Instagram, and someone's got a clip of some citizen jumping into the water to save someone in a river. 
okay, someone's making a human chain to pull some puppy out of a, out of a river. I'm obsessed with rivers right now because I'm parked to the LA river next to the LA river here. I'm in my car, by the way, to keep me in the parking lot mindset. Um, but you know what I'm saying? When you find these videos and these little clips going around, uh, those should be viral. Team good guys should be sharing that information with everyone. So if you don't get the chance very often to be heroic, but you see someone else being heroic, let everybody around you know that you think that's cool. If someone's standing up for themselves, go over there and say, good for you. Let every good guy know that there are other good guys right there next to them. I think that kind of peer pressure is very positive. Usually we think of peer pressure as something negative. Hey man, have a cigarette. Don't you want to be cool like me? But peer pressure works the other way too. Um, You can use mob mentality for positive change. Hey, we're all going to go help this homeless guy. We're all getting together. We're going to donate some food and some clothing. We're going to help get this guy a job. Community coming together. Team good guys working for a common cause. Hey, we're having a blood drive. Hey, we're collecting food for Thanksgiving. You know what I'm talking about. You're probably involved in these types of efforts. Keep that up. Keep championing the good guys. That's how you can show the bad guys that they're outnumbered. All right, so I'm kind of coming to the end of this rant. There was one other thought here that I thought was kind of interesting, something I'm going to have to live with, a little bit of shame. (laughs) I mentioned in the other episode, episode 50, that um, I did feel compelled to take some of the action uh, out of my own fear that my wife would think I was a wimp if I didn't do something. I mean, hey, what kind of husband am I if I let these punks break into our cars and run off down the street <laughs> and, uh, and I don't punch this guy? I don't tackle that guy? What kind of man am I? Old school thinking, right? Um, <laughs> in this case... I thought after this was all over, I was home free. I mean, she just saw me chase down this guy, get my mitts on him, put him on the ground, stay in control. Um, And afterwards, I said to her, I was like, geez, you know, I'm not even sure I was going to chase him, but you took off. So, you know, I I, I wanted to help. And she said, oh, I wasn't going to tackle that guy. You know, I just wanted to make noise. And I was like, oh, my God. And I said, well, I was a second point. I said, you know, I had the guy, so... In the future, you know, I appreciated the help, but you didn't really have to jump in. I don't want to put you in any danger. Uh, I had that under control. And she said, (laughs) she said, hey, the only reason I jumped in is because nobody else was helping and because you weren't doing any moves. Mm. Do you know how long I'm going to have to live with that one? (laughs) I wasn't doing any moves. Keep in mind, my wife doesn't practice martial arts um, and she actually doesn't actually see me do this stuff very often either. She doesn't come to my classes. She's not, she, if anything, she's always saying, uh, why do you keep going? Like, don't you know enough by now? So she doesn't get that. So in her mind, she was really expecting that I was going to go over there and do some kind of, you know, Hong Kong fooey, uh, super karate chop to the throat. Ay-yah! But that's not what I was doing. Uh, what I was doing, I thought was pretty cool. Afterwards, I'm trying to talk her down. I'm like, well, hang on. What do you mean I wasn't doing any moves? I said, did I get hurt? No. Did you get hurt? No. Did anybody get hurt? No. Did I hurt the guy? No. Did he have a mark on him? No. Is there any reason for him to sue us for being overly violent or aggressive? No. Is there even any reason for us to be on a police report? No. But he was contained and arrested, right? We did have him under control for 10 to 12 minutes, right? That is the move. Get it? That's the best move. If you go around wearing a black belt and wearing a jacket that says super cool fighter uh, and you go around punching people in the face when you don't have to, you might have some complications for that. You might have crossed that line from good guy to bad guy. Um, you might have a little control issue on, uh, on, your, on your soul. Anyway, that's just a little rant. I thought you might find that amusing. (laughs) I still think the best policy is to do the least amount you have to to make the situation work for you. All right, so let me wrap this up. I think I have one final thought here. My final thought. I think the big lesson here is you're on your own. You're born alone. You die alone. 
And in between, you're probably going to be fighting alone. Now, don't get me wrong. If you have friends who will help you, great. If you have family who will help you, great. If a stranger jumps in to help you, great. Just don't count on it. Make your strategy dependent on yourself first. And then whatever help comes your way, say thank you. On that same point, I have another episode of this podcast that you might be interested in. Episode number 12. It's called The Blonde Haired Warrior. In that show, I told the story about one of my neighbors, a young lady who got attacked in her driveway by a would-be rapist. She had a roommate that heard the whole incident through the door of their apartment. It happened right outside the door. Afterwards, when we asked, why didn't you do something? She said, I was too scared to open the door. You're on your own. (laughs) Get it? But that doesn't mean we can't challenge ourselves to be a little bit braver. Challenge ourselves to prepare a little bit more to do something when we need to. Remember this. It's not enough to be a good person on the inside. It's what you show on the outside that makes a difference. So be good and train to do good. That's how we can all fight for a happy life for ourselves and for each other. So that that's a, a pretty powerful experience. And I have to say that I'm fortunate. I haven't had anything like that ever happen to me. I mean, this is kind of your, your second occurrence. You did something back on, it was, uh, was it episode 50? I believe so, yes. Episode 50, which um, episode 50 has the distinction of being the episode just before the episode where you interviewed me. How about uh, that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, and you do. I, I couldn't remember what episode number it was and, and was going to look it up and then uh, noticed as I, I dug into the show notes, it was, it was right there. And I went, oh, that's we're, right. We're tied. That's right. This topic and I are tied, at least as it relates to your show. So it's, it's <laughs> but this, I think my biggest takeaway is at least from, from the way you conveyed it, the, the shock, the surprise that, you and your wife felt in that moment. Is that fair? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, The actual taking down of the guy and, you know, holding him, which is kind of, you know, your whole lifestyle, your training as a martial artist, you'd think that would be the number one thing in my head. Like, okay, let's talk technique and let's, you know, go back to that experience and how do you grab somebody? And, but it wasn't, it was just the psychology of human beings observing this event. The martial arts part was the easiest part. It was the Why isn't everyone on board with taking down a bad guy uh, or stepping forward and at least showing support? Because, again, I'm not asking everyone to pull out a a weapon (laughs) and come charging over and beat this guy. But even just to come closer, kneel down next to us and show support like, yeah, we're on your side. Yes, we got this. And Hey, this guy's not going anywhere to engage in some trash talk or have more people calling the police. Anything just to have this kind of zombie effect. That's what is so eerie to me and what will haunt me forever. Um, It's just because I was just looking up at all these people. I kept scanning the area, like I said, in case there was an accomplice or just I don't know what's going on. So I'm looking around and it was just all of these literally just zombies, just Mm. standing there, just gaping or just staring, just emotionless, just, and for time, that's the other part of it. It wasn't just for, well, in that moment, they weren't doing anything. Like, no, no, they had time to see what was happening process what was happening, make a decision about what to do or not to, not to do. And they still decided to just stand and watch. How and many of them had their phones out? Um, surprisingly, I didn't see phones because okay. I, I thought maybe I could go on Instagram and search on a hashtag and maybe somebody would have had some footage of it and I could have enhanced my podcast or my video by showing a little piece of it, uh, security footage, anything. I just thought maybe there'd be a piece and maybe I missed it. Maybe it is out there, but I didn't see people it wasn't uh, sensationalized in any way. No one was there going, oh, wow, look at this. Because it really wasn't that exciting. Once he was down, he was down, and we were just pinning him. So they were literally just just standing there mm-hmm. and um, not, not making a big fuss out of it at all. Just this weird, neutral, emotionless dead zone in a quiet parking lot. Just everyone just mm-hmm. like a church, just sitting there. <laughs> and it was just kind of eerie. Now, I think we could we could make the comment that, you know, people were scared, people, you know, they didn't know what to do. They were overwhelmed. We, we could say a lot of very defensive things 
But I think what is most telling as an anecdote from what you shared about the psychology was the security guard trying to stop you yeah. from what you were doing. That's right. <laughs> which I'll, I'll, I'll confess, over the last couple of weeks, I've reflected on this a lot because as I mentioned to you before we went live, this was kind of a kick in the head to me. Well, you know, I understand that most security guards are under the, um, the order to observe and report. They're not supposed to be engaging anybody. They don't want to open themselves up to lawsuits. They shouldn't be putting their hands on anybody. So I understand that. So perhaps they were torn morally inside their own souls. But there were plenty of other people there that did not have that restriction. And as a citizen, could easily have just come over and, like I said, lent some kind of support, even if it was just verbal support going, yeah, yeah, got them anything. But to be voiceless and motionless is unacceptable. <laughs> I, I agree. Now, of course, in the moment, in any situation where adrenaline is up, we act in you know a fairly basic way. So I, I've heard some people say that you know, you're always going to respond at your, not your highest level of training. That's where you want to be, but it's yeah. your lowest level of training. You know, we, we, and, and we see that in video footage of people getting into fights on the street. You know, it, it never looks good, right? It's always sloppy and slaps and whatever. Well, so as, as you look back on this, because I'm sure you've reflected back on this quite a bit, would sure. you have interacted with the crowd in a different way? Would you have spoken to them differently, asked for help or, or, or something? Well, um, again, my wife did. She, she did look up and a couple of times say, help us hold him, help us. So she did make that, that, um, that effort. Um, and, you know, and I know I've heard the advice in emergency situations that you should be very specific uh, because of the kind of group dynamic that you should point to one person individually and say, you, pick up your phone, call the police. You, come over here and hold his leg and actually make them feel like an individual instead of allowing them to kind of fade into the background. So that would be one tip that I would give. Yes, if you do need assistance, um, don't just let out a general cry to the general public. Lock eyes with one specific person so they feel that individual responsibility that they've been called out to do something. And again, I believe most people still are good people. And I think then when they're led to uh, what to do, they will help. So that would be one thing I would do differently. And again, they were kind of far away. <laughs> they really were staying back. Uh, uh, if they were closer, it would have been easier to go, hey, man, you, yeah, you in the, in the red jacket there, get over here and put your hand on that wrist, hold that. Um, that would have been easier, but they, they were kind of far back. So you'd really have to pick out someone like, hey, over there. Uh, I think I see you. Yeah, you over there. Um, but anyway, I, I would give that advice. Single people out and tell them exactly what you want them to do. I think that's going to help out a lot better than general command. Mm. Now, one of the things that you talked about was that you're, you were surprised at your wife's response. What has the conversation between the two of you been since that? Oh, know. you don't want to go there, Jeremy. Really? You don't want to go there. I, <laughs> no. I, I do. I do, though, because I, I you know, it's, uh, I, I don't know if you're, be, if you're being sarcastic. Yeah, I'm just kidding. Okay. I'm kidding. All right. Yeah. What, what no, has secret. that conversation been? Um, well, uh, we just, it basically was all that night. She hasn't, we haven't really talked about it since I told her I was going to put it on video and she's like, are you sure you want to do that? I'm like, yes, of course. Cause again, we're just, you know, we're different people. So that's, <laughs> that's always fun. But, um, the, the main thing was that I know that she's a doer, right? I mean, I married her for a reason. She's, she's my kind of person. She's an action taker. Uh, she's, she's ballsy. She, she gets into situations. She's been an, uh, an athlete for most of her life. Um, so I'm not surprised that she was willing to engage or step up or stand up to somebody. I'm not surprised by that part. Um, I was just surprised at the timing when she did take off after this guy in that moment, because as we're getting older, like I said, and we were both kind of banged up a little bit, um, I was surprised that she immediately started running. Uh, I was like, oh, what? Uh, but again, I was confused. She wasn't planning to tackle him. She was planning to just uh, raise awareness like, hey, hey, get that guy. So the conversation there, once I cleared that, I was like, okay, I see. So next time you take off, um, I, maybe I wouldn't have the same presumption that you're going to try to tackle him because, but again, I'm not sure because I've seen her stand up to other people before. So I still, I probably, I think the same thing's going to happen again. If there's trouble, she, when she hears sirens, she always says, oh, let's go see what's going on. She's just, you want to get up and go look at things. So, um, 
that part of the conversation, I think, will always be a little bit of a gray area as a relationship. Um, just uh, how far are you going to go? I don't know how far are you going to go. I'm not sure. How far would you like to go right now? I'm not sure. So I think we'll always be kind of sensing each other's vibe to go. Are, you, is it, are we in on this one or what are we going to do here? Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm just babbling about that. I'm not sure. The bigger conversation after that was just like, like I said about the technique part of it. Um, what is the expectation in this situation? Now, this is the second time that I've kind of had to process my own ego to say, should I be doing anything for the sake of her? Do I need to show my wife that all this time I go to martial arts classes is not for nothing? You know, do I need to add a fancy looking move or sweep or some kind of choke out just to let her know, hey, I'm cool. You know, the guy you married is not a, a wimp or, uh, you know, I'm not wasting my time with martial arts stuff. Um, of course, I, I got over that very quickly. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't regret it. The way it went down was exactly right. And the fact that if she or anyone doesn't understand that real martial arts is the art of handling a situation with the minimum of effort, not going overboard at, in any way, um, that was the part where I learned about myself. Like, hey, I can do that. Yeah, I can just bring it in uh, low key. I can get things done without making a show of it or losing my mind or being adrenalized, like you said. Um, that, that could be a whole other show. Cause I think that's a, I think that's a, a myth. So what is the point of training? Oh, I'm going to go off on a rant here. I'm sorry. By all means, what is the point of training? If you're still at the mercy of your adrenaline and fear and panic, the whole point of training is that you're not adrenalized when other people are, that you can act smoothly when other people are stumbling. Otherwise, how could you be a fighter pilot? How could you be a sniper? The whole point is they go through training so that they don't react like normal people. So uh, one thing about myself, this is not a brag, it's just, I was, oh, that's a nice, nice surprise. As I was running after this guy and I knocked him down and grabbed him and put him down, I was not adrenalized. That's why I was clear-headed enough to not do anything uh, unnecessary. It was actually the most boring part of the story. That was like, well, yeah, yeah, I got him now. I know what the seatbelt leads to. He's not going anywhere. I've done this before. So that part was the easy part. The stress was like, where are the cops? Why are they not here yet? This is just embarrassing. I'm lying on the ground. I want to go home. I'm like, I think my knee's bleeding. Oh, my jeans, I like these jeans, son of a, you know, that was the stuff that was filling my head. It had nothing to do with the actual physical part. That was the easier part. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I would hope that anybody listening, presumably you're a martial artist, the more you train, uh, the easier those types of uh, situations should be. Your technique should be there for you. If your training is, you know, got the pressure in it and some resistance in it and you're pushing yourself and challenging yourself, I would hope that that part is the easy part. The difficult part, is determining when to engage and, um, and I guess just trusting yourself to do the right thing when you need to. Uh, and that's the bigger part of this whole experience that most people don't explore those issues at all. They don't question when would I do something? When would I not? If I do do something, how far am I willing to go? What am I willing to fight for? What am I not willing to fight for? Um, those are the big issues because the physical technique part's actually the easiest, right? Swinging punches, anybody could just start Hurting somebody, hurting people is easy. Trying to figure out when and how far to go, I think those are the harder issues. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, as we look over this story, you you did a really good job of articulating the emotion and and a lot of the details. And I, I think you may have even said it because you were there on the ground for such a long time. You had the ability right. to take in a lot of what was going on around you. And I think the last thing I want to talk about before I let you go today is this idea that it's a little sad, I, I think, the reality here that people are less willing to help than we want to think. Now, I say people, I'm not saying an individual person. You'd, you did have someone come over and help you. Obviously, yeah, your wife Jaren. helped you. And you even articulated some of the, the psychology there that in a group, people are uncomfortable straying from what the group is doing. That to call out a specific person, you do this, mm -hmm. you do that. But the sad part for me is that the group doesn't want to help. So what has been your response, your thought process from this? Have you, do you look at the world any differently now? Um, no, and because it's the same world. Um, but I, I, I reflect, I reflect back to like nine 11 and 
um, I think I did a podcast um, talking about how after 9-11, uh, we had to take a flight uh, back home for Christmas, and uh, that was pretty soon after. And, of course, everything at airports was on high alert. And there was – I remember being on the plane a couple months after 9-11, and you could just – maybe maybe I'm crazy, but I thought you could just feel that everybody on that plane was together. We were a team. We weren't talking to each other about it specifically, but I just felt like if anybody stands up on this plane <laughs> to cause any kind of trouble, I felt that we were all on the same page. We were all looking at each other. We were all paying attention. And I just knew that if anybody causes trouble, this is going to be an immediate mob to get up and get that guy down as fast as possible. And I just felt that kind of team spirit, if that makes sense. And when you have a huge tragedy or something that's in everybody's mind and it becomes a cultural moment, that team spirit, I think, is there and people are more willing to engage because they already know that it's the right thing to do or it's the cool thing to do. If you remember after like 9-11, people had like flags in their windows, driving around in their cars, and there was this whole Team USA kind of spirit. And I just, I mean, it's unfortunate that we need to have tragedies to remind us all that we're all on the same team, good guys, I mean, whether it's the United States or just good people in general, that the culture of being good guys should never be out of our minds. We should always remember that we're not alone, that if you're willing to help someone, someone else is willing to help you. There are far more good guys than bad guys out there, and that just gets forgotten. We get led off by the headlines and the, and the, the sad stories and the tragedies that happen in the papers, and we feel like these separations, and oh, it's red states and blue states and men versus women, and everybody's got their own group and their own flag, and we forget the bigger picture. We're earthlings. We're all in this together, <laughs> and martial arts is a great way to build up your power so that when team good guys need you, you're there. You can do your part. Even if it's just a little part, you can do it. So the big lesson to me is, like I said, that I think I recommended, if you can let people know that you support them when you see them doing something good, whatever that is, a like on their, their post, uh, a slap on the back, buy them a cup of coffee, just give them a wink. Um, that means a lot. You know that if, if, if you in any part of your life, if someone comes over and just gives you a kind word or, or a moment of support and says, hey, I like what you did there. Wow, I, I saw that. That was really cool. That stays with you because it's not that common. <laughs> Critics are much noisier. Sometimes I think good guys need to remember that praise and support should be just as loud or just as omnipresent as, as criticism and negativity. Um, and of course, I mean, you're part of that mission. You spread positive vibes on a martial arts podcast where it could just as easily devolve into style bashing and criticizing other people's martial arts styles. Um, your show is incredibly positive. That's why I love this show. Um, because you're building bridges, not building walls. So I'm all board on board for that. And I hope anybody listening feels empowered to know that they're not alone. If they feel like they're a good person and they feel like a hero in their own circle, social circles, keep doing that. Put on the cape. Stand up a little taller, smile a little longer, shake hands, pat backs, let good people know that they are not alone. Love it. Thank you. And of course, if you are not listening to Santa Ando's show, Fight for a Happy Life, you should be. And, and I'll let him tell you where, where you can find that and, and your social media and all that stuff, sir. Well, thank you very much, sir. And again, it was an honor to be here. I appreciate your mission. And, uh, and um, yeah, people can find me uh, at senseiando.com fightforahappylife.com, Happy Life Martial Arts. Uh, I hope they'll come by and, like I said, try that free self-defense course. I'm not asking for anything, not even an email. It's just <laughs> two hours of self-defense basic training. I think every good guy, human, should know in the world. So if they can drop by and watch one or two of those, or watch the whole series, I think that would be uh, helpful for everybody. Awesome, awesome. Well, I want to thank everyone for their time listening today. And yeah. Yeah, you, you may have noticed very little self-promotion today. And that's that's because I want all the love going over here to, to my friend Sensei Ando, because this is this is a power this is a powerful story. And I hope that you will share it with other people because pretty much everybody in the martial arts community needs to hear this. So once again, sir, thanks for coming on. Appreciate your time. Amen. Love right back at you, sir. <laughs>